It's four o'clock on a Thursday, and you know what that means, don't you? It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi's Quarantini Happy Hour. Woohoo! Yeah, baby, here we go. Big, big Thursday edition, and thank you, fake audience. Thank you, fake band. Love them. How are you guys? Let's see who's in the chat room today. We've got Martin Gravel, uh, John Pearson, Jesse J. Peck, Ian Shortle, Alex Dillon, hello, Darren Moss, Dean Turner, just put on my makeup, my nose. <laughs> I got to remember, not well, you know, when you got a prominent proboscis, uh, as W.C. Fields used to say, you, you've got to make it less shiny, but I don't think the powder worked. Uh, let's see. We've got Jesse J. Peck, Riffs That Rule, Andre Stepanian, Steve Thompson, Edmund Red. It's a happy BMI day. Woohoo! Yeah, I didn't even remember that. That's because I don't have any compositions out there earning me money, but I hope you guys got some dollars and cents. Hello, Bob Gunnerfelt, Paul Etheridge, Scott Hansen. Hello. Five minutes of ML Logic review. Um, not much to tell you. Hello, Pete Mason, Lucian Lewis. Um, I didn't play with it much last night, honestly. Uh, maybe a half an hour. Um, I updated to the latest version, which is 10.5.1, I believe. And when I did that, I finally got the uh, Billie Eilish song. Um, so I played around with that a little bit. Uh, hello, songs from a headband, Crash Gates, uh, Ronald Schultz. Um, you know what I'm realizing is that more and more of today's music does not follow the song constructs of the past, you know, with intro, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus, and out. Um, People are putting songs together in all kinds of weird ways. Billie Eilish is a good example of that. Um, songs that uh, don't have, you know, like the traditional B verse or the pre chorus that lifts into the big boom chorus. Um, things are just different today. And uh, I'm not sure if I like it or don't like it, just noting that it's different, need to do more research. Um, people are burning bridges. There you go. Uh, <laughs> Ian Short will notice the cab. Yeah, the flowers died and the, the vase that my kids made me like uh, 10 years ago for a road rally um, was still sitting up there. The cleaning lady was here this morning. So uh, I, I put the cab up there. It's up on a lift right now getting serviced. <laughs> Uh, hello, Nancy Kalil. Um So what was her form? You know, honestly, I was too busy playing. I, I took note of the fact that the form was different, um, but spent more time playing with uh, equalizers and limiters than I did co concerning myself with the song form. I could just tell you it's not the same. Um uh, John Pearson, anything goes. I'm currently doing a collection of Korean ad songs for a library. Interesting research. Um, when you say Korean ad songs, are you talking about like uh, K-pop stuff, John? Uh, yeah, you would think that it would have had 10.5.1 on it. I thought it was the latest version, but... Uh, when I didn't see Billy, I only had um, whatever it was I said was in there for the demo the other day. Um, oh, the the Beck song. And I couldn't find any other demos. And I thought, hmm, wonder what version I have. So I did the Get Info and saw that I had like 10.47. Um, 10.47. So I did the old, uh, let's see if there's an update. And sure enough, it updated. It took it quite a while, as a matter of fact. K-pop uh, from Pearson. So yeah, um, we get quite a few K-pop listings um, and we find that more often than not, they're just asking us for straight like American pop 
And sometimes uh, if it's for a label, they'll say, you know, we want to have a translator translate, you know, give us the lyrics in English and we'll get a translator. Um, there may be a lyric rewrite, in which case the uh, person who does the lyric rewrite would participate in the uh, publishing on the writer's side. Um, but so far they're looking for straight American pop, but American pop is changing. Uh, let's see, John Pearson. Ah, John Pearson's looking uh, at translations for the hook to make sure it sings well in Korean. I can't wait to hear one of Pearson's songs where he's singing in Korean. That would be interesting. Um, Jim Stamper says, plus one for the Umbrella Academy. Can't wait for the next season. Yeah, Liz and I were talking about that earlier at the office. Uh, she's a fan as well. She's seen seasons one and two and says season two is even better. So... Uh, I'm excited uh, to keep watching that. We watched a couple episodes last night. Hello, Robert Orzachowski. Thank you for your suggested topic today, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, so it's here. I'm going to give you guys a view of outside today. Clearly, I mean, we all know because it's all over the news, not just I, I don't watch local news but even the national news is talking about the fires raging all over California. And so far, we haven't really had anything that was very close to where we are. Um, and today was the first day. Yesterday, the sky was a little weird. Today was the first day where it smelled smoky outside. And just now, I went out uh, five minutes before the show to do a gopher check, found a new gopher mound. Oh boy, something to do after the show today. Uh, picked a couple of tomatoes and um, what the hell was I talking about? Oh, I was out there and I looked down and I thought, oh man, hey, get me some head and shoulders. I got some dandruff going on. And then I realized it wasn't dandruff. There are the tiniest little particles of ash falling down, which means the fire can't be that far away. I, I mean, I don't think it's like, you know, five miles away, but it could be 20 miles away. And there's not a lot of wind, which is good. Um, yeah, the cab is up on the lift today. We're getting some work done on the exhaust system. Marion Laird said her friend in San Diego says raining ash on her home a couple days ago. Uh, nothing like a gopher hunt, that's for sure. Oh, here's something funny is uh, I had my pellet gun <laughs> sitting on a little bench near where I work uh, here. Um, so that if I saw a gopher, you know, while I'm sitting here popping its head up out in the yard that I could get the pellet gun take a shot at. Now, I don't want to get any letters from any animal lovers out there. I love animals as much as the next person, especially large format dogs like German Shepherds. Love them. But I hate gophers with a passion. Anybody who's ever had gophers, even if they're a hardcore animal lover, will tell you they are vile, disgusting little creatures that can wreak havoc on a yard. And uh, so I had the pelican sitting here. So yesterday, um, as a follow-up to our recent uh, uh, termite and rat visit from, uh, you know, we had whatever the name of the company is, the exterminator company come out, and uh, we've had the house rat-proof before, but uh, we have heard a couple of rats up in the attic at night, which is always disturbing. Um, so we had the house re-rat-proofed with more modern technology, and part of the deal was they're supposed to come out once a week after they set the traps in the attic. They just put snap traps up there supposed to come and check them once a week. Well, two or three days after they were here, one night Deb and I were in bed watching TV and I hear clunk, clunk, clunk up in the attic. And uh, anybody who knows anything about rats and rat traps knows that when you hear clunk, clunk, clunk for five minutes, it means that a rat got caught in the trap, but it didn't break its neck and kill it instantly. Sad for the rat. Uh, and I was sitting in bed just snickering and Deb's like, what's so funny? And I said, well, clearly there's a rat up there that either got caught 
by the paws or um, caught by the tail. I don't know, whatever. The trap didn't kill it and the rat is running around up there trying really hard to shake off the trap. So finally, I called the exterminator and I said, look, I owe you guys a few thousand dollars. Um, I'm not paying it until Rat Boy shows up because he didn't live up to his end of the bargain. I'm not going to live up to mine and pay you until uh, you guys do what you promised to do. So a couple days later, Rat Boy shows up and uh, he uh, <laughs> was out in the back for a second and came in through the, the French doors into the main part of the house. And he looks down, he sees this gun, rifle, <laughs> laying on the uh, the bench by my work area. And I says, just a BB gun. <laughs> I didn't even want to say pellet gun, because that's probably too violent in Southern California. Uh, just a BB gun. He looks so relieved. <laughs> oh, man. Michael's Ark, yep. No, I don't want any snakes. Uh, I did see a snake out in the backyard not that long ago. Go, go, Covers. <laughs> oh, man, you guys are busy in there today. Uh... <laughs> Scott has had a pet gopher. It died. Now he has to get his own coffee and donuts. That's funny. Uh... Uh, when did Taxi first start using the genre term singer-songwriter? Is this a description uh, in general, a relatively new genre? No, singer-songwriter's been around forever. Uh, well, forever, at least back to the 60s or 70s. Uh, hello, Giovanni. Yeah, I, I did look like a kid on Christmas morning with my uh, Apple and Logic. Um, how many music libraries, this is from JL or J1 or JI, uh, how many music library companies does Taxi list briefings for? Um, a lot. I, I mean, like, we have thousands of companies that we have worked with, and I would say typically they kind of come and go in, um, in waves. Like a, a library will take the time to sit down and analyze where they're weak or what parts of their catalog need to be refreshed and run a bunch of listings with us. And then they're like satiated for a while and they disappear for three or four months and they come back again or they get a request for something that they don't have and they hit us up. So they come and go. It's not like they're all requesting music on a regular, consistent basis. Um, we're working with two or three libraries right now that are building brand new catalogs uh, almost entirely from scratch, so they're running a lot of listings with us. But the last time I checked, which was actually just a couple of weeks ago, I think that I think I asked the guys in the A and R department to print me a list of relatively recent listing companies, which are largely libraries, but not entirely. We obviously have record labels and indie film producers and music supervisors and major labels. But I would say probably, I don't know, something like 65, 75% of the work, uh, the requests we get are from libraries. There were about a thousand companies on that list. And I wanna say, I, I could be wrong about this, I'm doing it totally from memory, but I think it was like a year or two ago, I looked at, um, in our database or something in an A&R meeting, and I want to say there were either 6,000 or 9,000 companies in total over the years that we've worked with, so a lot is the answer. Um, there you go. Orzachowski says, Carol King, one of the first classified as a singer-songwriter. So yeah, you know that... Um, Late, uh, you know, like uh, Neil Young would be a singer-songwriter. Um, you know, when did his stuff start coming out? 67, 68. Um, I'm sure there were others. Um, James Taylor, Carol King. All, all those FM singer-songwriters, they were like the first big notable wave of singer-songwriters. I think that's when people started commonly using um, that phrase. Pete Seeger, yeah, there you go. Wow, 
why aren't there more requests for reggae music? I don't know. That's one of those genres that seems to be popular with the members. But um, I, you know what? Here's my guess, Scott, is because reggae doesn't change dramatically over the years. I mean, yeah, there are people that do modern versions of reggae, kind of bastardized versions of reggae or kind of reggae pop. There's reggaeton. Uh, but straight up reggae is always kind of the same. So maybe the companies that have reggae feel like they've got enough of, you know, they don't need to refresh that very often. Um, let's keep talking about contemporary song production and contemporary song structure. Um, oh, what do you want to talk about? Uh, I'm trying to think of something really brilliant to say. Nothing's coming to mind at the moment, Robert or Darren. Yeah, basically the definition of a singer-songwriter is somebody who writes a song and sings their own thing. Um, if they're in a band, then it, it usually connotates a, a solo artist, I would think. Um but certainly you have bands that do stuff that is singer-songwriter-ish. Um, you know, it could be, I mean, look, James Taylor, Carol King, all those guys um, had, they wrote their songs that they performed, but they had a band behind them, but they were considered to be singer-songwriters. Um, what is agro music? I've only recently become familiar with that, and it's basically anything that's aggressive. Uh, we're going to miss out a, listing, a lot of listings. Um, Aaron Northern is asking a question I'm not understanding. Um, I actually took an allergy pill about an hour ago, and it's actually making my vision a little blurry. Uh, are we going to miss out on a lot of listings with the Kardashians ending? I didn't know um, uh, that the Kardashians are ending... Uh, Oh, let me go get a box of Kleenex. I feel like I'm going to cry. <laughs> um, no, that wasn't what I was looking for. No, not that one either. Let me see. Do I have a sound effect um, for the Kardashians ending? Um, <laughs> there you go. That's my best sound effect for the Kardashians <laughs> Um, does Million Dollar Listing by chance use taxi music? I'm pretty sure almost every reality show on TV at some point or another has taxi member music on it because there's so many taxi members with so many pieces of music in so many libraries. You'd be really hard pressed to find any reality TV show that doesn't have taxi member music in it. Uh, some more than others. Um, because there are some libraries that are that use taxi over and over and over again and have built you know the majority of their catalogs using taxi uh, as their main resource and they might you know some reality shows might use two three four different catalogs and maybe two or three or four of those catalogs were largely built on taxi member music so there are some shows where you just hear a ton of it Man, you guys are busy in the chat today. I'm sorry. For those of you who are not familiar with the format of the, of the Quarantini Happy Hours, it's very informal. Um, some days it's entertaining. Some days it's educational. Some days it's both. I'm not sure what it, what it is today other than me trying to read what's flying by in the chat room. Like Darren Moss's comment about the Kardashians, don't have anything nice to say about somebody who shouldn't say anything at all. So about the Kardashians, I will say, um, 
Yeah, maybe the Kardashians are ending the show so that they can hit the campaign trail with Kanye. <laughs> Peter Rahill says, reposting um, current trends per my meeting with the Nashville production company yesterday, three minutes, 15 seconds, first chorus, first chorus, bridge chorus and out, uh, still flies, get to the first chorus by 35 seconds. Yeah, I would say if there's a genre that sticks to, uh, you know, the typical um, song form, that would be it. Uh, Pearson's got a question. Um, wasn't it Ralph Murphy that used to break down songs by length of intro, instrumentation, how long it took you? Absolutely. Yeah, if you guys have never read um, Murphy's Laws of Songwriting or Murphy's Laws, the book, um, Google that. Um, Liz, maybe you could uh, check it out on Amazon and post a link for everybody. It's a great book. For many, many, many years, my dear friend Ralph Murphy worked with students, um, I think it might have been grad students in the music department at Belmont in Nashville, um, and they did studies where they analyzed all the hits on the pop chart and the country chart as to how many, you know, uh, had an intro, how many didn't have an intro, um, how long the intros typically were, um, were the songs male from a male perspective, a female perspective, um, were the lyrics positive versus negative, was the protagonist in the song a hero, all kinds of different things they looked at. And he would do uh, a presentation every year at the road rally about it. It was fascinating. You know, some people would come up to me after Ralph did his thing on the stage in the Grand Ballroom and say, man, you know, it's so formulaic. But uh, our brains have been wired over a couple of centuries, I believe, to um, kind of expect stuff to have a chorus. Um, I'm going to try and see if I can get this straight. But back in the days of, you know, I don't know if it's medieval times or medieval, if you say it correctly. Um, but back when kings had castles and villages and the shires, you know, and and minstrels, uh, roving minstrels would go from village to village or kingdom to kingdom, and they would perform for the king's court. Um, at some point, somebody discovered that the minstrels got that got invited back and were the most popular were... Um, the ones that had a reframe where they repeat, repeated something. And, and the people in the king's court really liked that. And uh, I've read that in several places that that was the birth of the chorus. So I think from that point forward, um, we like things that are in a form. Uh, I, I've mentioned this before in the show. You go to a movie, you know, and if a, a film script and the film itself is kind of disjointed and all over the place, um, it, it doesn't hold your interest. But if you can feel that it's got, um, i trying to think of the right word, you know, like a purpose and, and it's moving forward and it's making sense, it's probably, that's, that's why there are books on um, screenwriting. You know, um, some of the biggest books, I think the guy's name is Goldman that wrote a bunch of classic books on screenwriting. They all talk about form, every one of them. And the same thing is true for, um, for songwriting. But um, I would say that those regular song forms, uh, you know, in indie, indie pop, um, to some extent, singer, songwriter, um, Billie Eilish, great example. Things are changing and, and the public likes it. The brain does like patterns, absolutely. Okay, so um, I went online and saw that Robert Orzachowski, 21 hours ago, posted this in yesterday's comments and I really appreciate that because some days I need material for the big show. And he said, perhaps we can talk about the importance of mastering, especially when and how to EQ during the mastering phase. I'm more of the mind that the majority of the EQ I during, I'm more of the mind that the majority of the EQ I do during the mix phase. Um, I don't understand that sentence, Robert. <laughs> 
The mastering stage for me is some minimal touching up and bringing the track up to fit the overall concept of the album. In the mixing arena, uh, maybe we could chat about side chaining and how effective it can be in the mix. Okay, so let's leave that off to the side, no pun intended, uh, for the moment. Let's talk about mastering. I am not a world-class expert on mastering. However, uh, I was very fortunate back in my days at Criteria Studios in Miami, Florida in the mid-70s during that wonderful golden period um, that I was a welcome hanger-outer in the mastering room at Criteria, and they mastered a bunch of huge, huge, huge records in that room. Um, it was well known. Um, there were a few independent mastering studios that were very popular, and then there were a few of the big studio studios that had several, you know, rooms and a mastering room. Um, Criteria was one of the more popular um, studios with a mastering room in the facility. So, first of all, mastering came about, and I've probably mentioned this before, but not everybody has watched every episode, so I'm going to say it again. Back in the day, they used a heated, vibrating, um, diamond-tipped head on the mastering lathe. And they would put this lacquer down, which was literally an aluminum disc that was dipped in lacquer until it was a certain thickness. And then they would use microscopes to look for bubbles or defects in the lacquer. And every time they found a perfectly flat, perfectly smooth lacquer disc, it would be saved for mastering. Now, that was done in a manufacturing plant in the studio or the mastering house would buy boxes of lacquers. So they would put one on this thing that looked like a giant industrial-sized turntable. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, a vacuum would suck the disc down to the turntable platter, which was very heavy. It was probably like a 30 pound platter, usually with um, cork on the top of it. And the disc would sit on that with a spindle in the middle, much like a turntable. And the vacuum would hold the lacquer disc very tightly on the turntable. So then um, as the music played, it would then, the um, signal would translate to a transducer. Well, oh, didn't bring the phone with me today, and now the home phone is ringing. It's probably Rat Boy calling <laughs> to see. Have you heard any more clunking in your attic? So um, as that um, transducer with the needle embedded in it went up and down like that, it cut the waveform in the grooves of the record. And that, of course, would translate uh, in the opposite, 180 degree opposite, when you... Let me go grab the phone. Okay, flu shot, COVID vaccine, we're all gonna be poked full of holes soon. Okay, so um, the grooves were cut, but if you didn't put a limiter on it, then the, um, the amplitude, meaning how much, how high the wave was and translated into the needle that cut the grooves, um, sometimes, you know, like a, a big kick drum or a big bass note or a big guitar thing would make it cut so deeply that it would cut down to the, um, the aluminum disc inside the lacquer, making it worthless. So they would have to throw out the lacquer. Um, it would also, um, even if it didn't go that far down into the lacquer, um, if the grooves were too fat, that meant that the walls between the grooves, this groove and that groove and the groove next to it, um, then you would actually get some bleed through through the walls of the grooves. And it sounded kind of like pre-delay, if you will. Um, so they used limiters 
to make sure that you didn't get too much amplitude causing grooves that were too deep or too wide, um, which caused those problems I just mentioned. And the other thing was, yes, back then everybody did albums and um, it's not necessarily, back then more so than now, back then records were mostly cut in the same studio, but not always. So, you know, you might have a big band like Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young that might have done stuff at a studio in Colorado and then did some stuff at a studio in San Francisco and then did stuff in a studio at Criteria and all these different songs done by different engineers in different rooms, different times of the year would then be put together on an album. Well, they would have varying degrees of bottom, middle and top EQ on them. So, you know, maybe the stuff done in San Francisco didn't have a really nice silky top end on it. Maybe the stuff done in Colorado um, had a little, you know, was a little shy on the bottom. Um, and the stuff that was done at Criteria sounded perfect. <laughs> so the mastering engineer would actually go song by song by song and try and get everything to sound balanced so that the bottom, middle, and the top sounded pretty close to each other so the record had a consistency from song to song to song. Um, and of course, level was a big part of that consistency. They wanted it to sound um, all at the same level because we all know that when you're listening to music, if the first one is nice, if the level's nice and robust and you can hear everything nicely and then the next song is you know, eight or 10 dBs lower, you're like, huh, what? And you have to reach over and turn it up. Of course, they didn't want consumers having to adjust their stereos from song to song to song uh, for the bass, treble, and mid-range, nor the volume. And more importantly, they didn't want radio stations to play a song that was at a level that was lower than the song before it, or God forbid, at a lower level than the commercials that ran between the songs. So that was the original purpose and execution. Uh, look, the crows have arrived. It must be, yep, 4.30, the crows are here. Um, how do they know? How do they know that it's 4.30? Curious. Oh, well. Um, so that was the original intent and execution of mastering. Nowadays, frankly, I'm out of touch with it. I, I know that, yeah, basically you want, uh, the, the goal of mastering is to create a certain amount of uniformity if you're doing a record from track to track to track. Um, and also you've got to watch levels for, um, so that you're not smashing the circuitry and, and making the zeros and ones in the digital realm crap out and make your thing sound horrible. But mastering has also become a big component, I believe in today's mastering, is getting as much level um, on there as possible. People are constantly, oh, crow is eating a tomato. <laughs> I better start working with the drapes closed. <laughs> uh, so that's the thing. And the average home studio owner, which didn't exist back in the day, and certainly now, you know, there are millions of them, um, and they want their stuff to be competitive, even when it's going to music libraries. So now we're back to you guys um, and what you need to know about mastering. Um, so yeah, you know, if, if you have good monitors, you don't even have to have great monitors, just reasonably good monitors, but you have to know how they translate to the outside world. If I do a mix on these monitors and the bottom, middle, and top sound where I want it to be, um, and I go ahead and play that on a uh, car stereo, or I listen to it in earbuds, or I listen to it uh, on my computer through a pair of little desktop you know, USB speakers, are the relative amounts of bass, treble, and mid-range you know, consistent? Does it sound good? It's not going to sound identical in all those systems, but the way that a mastering engineer would probably say it is, does it translate well to the rest of the world? Meaning all those different forms of speakers or places that you might listen in. Obviously there are variables like the room you're listening in. Is it, you know, a bright reflective room? Is it a dead room with a lot of carpet and soft surfaces? Those things have an effect as well. But 
they're looking for that magic um, sweet spot of this sounds pretty darn good everywhere. So if you're mixing at home, let's say you're using, you know, a pair of uh, the little KRKs with the six inch woofers in them, which seems to be a pretty popular home studio monitor. Um, and it sounds good there and it translates well to other places you listen to your mixes then a mastering engineer it, it won't have very much work to do. Um, but mastering engineers are not mix engineers. That's the, the important distinction is mastering engineer. It's kind of like a brain surgeon. Brain surgeon is great at doing surgery, but wouldn't make a good um, orthopedic surgeon. You wouldn't want a brain surgeon, you know, like doing a hip replacement on you and vice versa. So mastering engineers are artisans of a certain type and they get stuff. Sometimes I have friends that have done a lot of mastering and they tell me sometimes I get stuff and I barely have to do anything other than just make the levels consistent, you know, maybe add a little um, overall limiting to it. Um, I think I've mentioned this before when there was a taxi group called Bob Goblin back in mid 90s, late 90s. Um, and we managed them for a short period because they couldn't find a manager that they liked. And when the record was done being mixed and was off to the mastering place, they asked me if I would go supervise the mastering session. And, and I was a little reluctant because a mastering engineer doesn't want somebody else in the room saying, well, can you do this? Can you do that? Because then they're not bringing their craft, their ears and their expertise to the project. Now it's just you telling them, you know, paint it this way. So they don't love that. Um, and frankly, I don't know that I would have loved a mastering engineer standing behind me at the console when I was mixing a record. But so I, I reluctantly went to that mastering session. The mastering engineer waited for everybody else to be out of the room. And he turned around and he looked at me. He actually kind of knew who I was and, and knew my history. And he said, you know what my secret sauce is? And I said, what? what's your secret sauce? And I thought he was going to tell me about some esoteric piece of gear that he had that was like, you know, some $20,000 limiter that he put on it or some custom made EQ that some little old German craftsperson made for him. And actually all it was, was he ran the output of the two track tape machine uh, into another two-track tape machine, which was about a 1980s vintage Ampex tape machine. Not the old, you know, like stainless steel or brushed steel looking ones. A um, little more modern version, but Ampex happened to make a two-track. I can't remember. I can't remember the model number. I'm sure you could pick one up now for like $500. And the electronics on that thing just sounded awesome. They, it was kind of like an Aphex Oral Exciter and a Nevi Q rolled into one thing. And he would literally just patch into the input side of that two track and then patch out of the output side of the two track, never even loading it up with tape but just running the signal through the electronics in that tape machine made everything sound better. And it had enough of its own kind of intrinsic compression in the electronics that the guy barely had to do anything else other than maybe move the master fader up and down between songs <coughs> to match the levels. Let me grab a cough drop. <clears throat> Today's sponsor is Hall's Relief Cough Drops. <clears throat> anyway, so Ken Beard and any stories of how the artist helped you become a better engineer. Um, yeah, but you know, I've told you so many of these. Uh, um, <clears throat> I will if you remind me in a, in a minute, I'll tell you about well, I've told you guys this like 10 times. Uh, the short version is Neil Young said to me, 
stop worrying about uh, the EQ and the lever uh, and the limiters and all your outboard gear. He said, just capture the performance, man. It's all about the performance and the vibe and capturing the moment. Best advice I ever got. So, yeah, you know, Robert, uh, you say in your in your question, the mastering stage for me is some minimal touching up or bringing the track up to fit the overall concept of the album. Um, and if concept is a euphemism for, you know, wanting it to all sound like it was done in the same studio and has, you know, a, a similar amount of bottom, middle, and top on, on all the songs, so it's consistent from song to song to song, and the levels consistent from song to song to song, and you know, some overall, you know, bus compression is consistent from song to song to song. There you go. That's it. And, and does mastering make stuff sound better? Yeah, but it's rare that it's like, ah, you know, and, and the light shines down from the heavens and the angels sing, and it sounds magically so much better. Um, if I had to put a number on it, you know, does it give it a 10 or 15% improvement? Yeah. Um, would the average person hear it? Probably not. But if you, if somebody, if the average consumer bought an album and listened to that and it hadn't gone through the hands and ears of a mastering engineer, they might notice the inconsistency. They probably would notice the inconsistency. What they probably don't know is that magical record sound, you know, that we all chase. Everybody, I remember, man, the first couple of years I was sitting at a console, I was ashamed of my own work. You know, I, I was fairly fast. I was capable. I was able to make clients happy. But I would just listen to my stuff at home at night and go, why does my stuff not sound as good as work by other engineers that were friends of mine and peers? And um probably because I wasn't doing as much to the mix bus. I, I wasn't sort of pre-mastering. I rarely used a bus compressor. Uh, I'm not um, a big fan. I might be after, you know, I become more capable on Logic uh, and things are just so much easier uh, looking at Logic. It's like, oh, I want to use that. I'll select that and I'll put that on my mix bus and um, give, you know, give it like SSL mix bus compression. And, you know, I had an SSL. Um, with and those compressors on their mix bus sound great. I didn't use it all that often, and if I did, um, I would use it just a, as like a, a safety net, so that if something was gonna hit, you know, the the mix machine, the two track, a little too hard, um, it was nice. It was comforting to know that I had the SSL. Um, limiter set so that if it hit a certain peak that it would bring it down and not crap everything out. Um, side chaining. Honestly, things are so different with side chaining today than they were back in my day that I don't feel that I can speak about that. Um, you guys may know more about it than I do. Um, it's back in my day, um, a side chain not every compressor even had the ability for you to jack into a side chain on it. But basically the, the, the most basic thing about side chaining is one thing, an external force drives um, what the compressor is doing or what the limiter is doing. So people use that now as a very popular effect, especially in EDM and it creates a pumping sound. That's the best way I can describe it in the simplest terms is it creates a pumping sound that in the context of EDM records has become part and parcel to the overall sound of EDM. Um, I'm sure that there were times that I side chain stuff as an effect, but it was, back then it was a pretty rare occurrence. Um, Got to remember, you know, back in my day, um, we barely had synthesizers in the beginning of my career. I mean, it was like, if you had a Prophet 5 or an Oberheim, you were a happening dude. Um, those were like, ooh, look at that. They're bringing in the Oberheim. Wow. Um, mini Moogs were already a thing when I started engineering. But they're just 
a lot there weren't a lot of synthesizers in music i mean that billy eilish thing uh, first of all the vocal stack in the billy eilish thing wow um just mind-blowing by the way could you guys listen to the lead vocal on the billy eilish song that's the demo in logic and tell me if you hear this clicking effect i don't know if something is wrong <laughs> but i kept hearing this it wasn't quite distortion um it almost sounded intentional i've never heard anything like it right uh edmund red says it was for the ducking effect great example side chain yeah you would set up a side chain if you were mixing a radio commercial and you already had a two-track mix and now you're putting flying those two tracks onto a multi-track and then recording a voiceover and putting that on another track in the multi-track you would use the side chain so that the when the voiceover came in that was the external force that said okay knock the level down on the music bed 3 db so that the voiceover sticks out a little more very simple and practical use that's frankly i believe what side chaining was invented for yeah basically uh to let the signal from one track control the effect of another track it, it's it is that simple it, it, it's people talk about it with such reverence like it's this big damn deal I personally don't get it. Maybe a year from now, after you know, I'm more familiar with Logic, maybe I'll be using it all the time. Andre says, yes, the clicks are intentional, left in there for you to hear. Um, if you open the vocal track, there are 38 takes of Billie Eilish vocal. Yeah, I did that. But the lead vocal has the, this weird thing. It's almost like a delay that causes these things. Um, I personally didn't find it pleasing. You don't really hear it in the context of the whole track. But I'm sitting there, you know, as a, a retired engineer producer going, and why did they do that? I, I don't get it. Yeah, when I, I see the number of vocals in that vocal stack on the Billie Eilish thing, I'm going, okay, somebody was smoking weed and said, yeah, this would be cool, let's try it. Oh, that sounds good, let's do another one. Let's do another one. Let's do another one. <laughs> let's do another one. <laughs> I mean, um, oh man, what's the name of the song? I can't remember. Um, I'm sure Andre will know. I can't remember song titles or people's names. I'm telling you, make my kids wear name tags to the dinner table. <laughs> they don't use auto-tune. That's why 38 takes. Um, <clears throat> well, having worked uh, many, many hundreds of hours, actually, uh, with Crosby, Sills, Nash & Young, I would say they didn't use auto-tune and they didn't need to stack anything 38 times. It was like once or twice. Maybe, you know, on rare occasions they'd do a third pass, but then they'd go, nah, sounds too thick. Um, Darren Moss is asking the number of vocal stacks I think crosses the line. All depends on the song. All depends on what you're going for in your production. You know, I mean, honestly, you listen to the Billie Eilish thing with 38 vocals in the stack and go, this is really well crafted. Um, would anybody have noticed if it was a stack of five? To, you know, maybe if they're four or five harmony parts, like, you know, the... Um, the melody vocal followed by, you know, four other harmonies in there, you know, double track. I don't know. That's why I said maybe they were smoking weed and just thought that was really cool and fun. And look what Queen did. Um, and, and Queen's engineer, Roy Thomas Baker, actually used to um, adjust the bias frequency. The bias frequency is difficult to explain. <laughs> Bias is the frequency at which the 
record side of what a multi-track or any tape machine did. Um, it's kind of like how much energy um, took from a sound hits a diaphragm on a microphone, turns it into an electrical impulse, it goes into a recording console, hits the preamp, gets amplified because you need more level than you would get off the capsule of the microphone. So now it's coming out of the preamp and um, the hell was I just talking about? It's coming out of the preamp and um, I lost my train of thought. Oh, the Roy Thomas Baker tape machine. So um, once it comes out of the console, Roy Thomas, you want things to sound natural, like they sound in the room or like they sound in the control room. So there was an industry standard at which you biased the record heads, um, the electronics going into the record head of a tape machine. And you would lay tones on the multi-track tape. So if you move from one studio to another or every day when before the band came in, we would do tape machine alignments. We would align them for the frequency response on bass, mid-range, and treble. Um, and we would align maybe the azimuth and the zenith, the heads. Um, I think azimuth is this way and zenith is this way, if I remember correctly. So you would do all these little adjustments so that you had as close to perfectly, you know, like whatever we did yesterday will sound exactly like that today in this room or any other room. Um, accurate reproduction recording and reproduction. Well, Roy Thomas Baker got those sounds like on the cars, the band, the cars. Um, he would actually push the bias on his tape machines to these crazy intense levels or frequencies that um, gave him that kind of signature sound. I don't know how you would do that. To, well, there was probably a Roy Thomas Baker plug-in. <laughs> That's how you would do it today. Bias. What is bias? Um, I don't like you. Therefore, I'm biased against you. <laughs> I don't know. Look it up. I'm not, uh, I don't have an EE degree. Um, but uh, again, it, it's like a carrier frequency that enables the electronic impulse to get from through the electronics of the tape machine, which are usually in a little drawer or in a stack above the meters. Um, and you adjust all these things. So the electronic bias is adjusted for each and every track so that it's consistent from track one to track 24. And that meant that you got the same amount of mojo from the electronics putting the signal on the tape, moving the particles on the tape, making them stand up or lay down. I never thought I would be teaching a class on, you know, the... Um, the electronics involved in the recording process. Yeah, it's a calibration parameter. I mean, you would calibrate all these things. Yep, and the bias will affect the frequency response <clears throat> because if the tape machine is over-biased, which is what Roy Thomas Baker did, that means you're gonna get more top end. It doesn't mean that you're adjusting the frequency response, but you're adjusting something that does affect the frequency response as a byproduct. Wow, I can talk endlessly about just practically nothing. I really should have been on Seinfeld. Um, Let's see, I noticed on the success story thing in the forum that a taxi member named Susan Hillman said, I was happy to receive an email from BMI today informing me of my first check. It, it's like, you know, well, there are lots of things in life that you always remember your first. Your first check for your music might even be better than your first other stuff, maybe. Um, to say this was exciting is a huge understatement and happily it came in seven months, not nine months, which is another happy surprise. Thank you, Taxi, for helping me get started. This is great. You are so welcome, Susan. Thank you for taking the time to post that on the forum. Um, and here's one from our very own John Pearson, or as he's known on the 
Forum Johnny P. Just found out about this instrumental being used yesterday, September 6th, in a TV show in the Netherlands. They used both the A and the B section. Two usages totaling 51 seconds. What makes it special to me is this was my first try at doing a complete instrumental collection by myself. 21 instrumentals in total. Took about 50 days and it dropped last month. Thanks to Taxi because I met the library owner at the road rally. You are welcome, JP, and congratulations on that, man. That's cool. 50 days worth of... So, wow. 50 days to do 21 instrumentals. You work your butt off. So there you go. We've got five minutes left, and I've still got a little bit of my cough drop left. Um... Any other questions? Cough drops can save your life, or they can kill you if you inhale one. I'm going to chew this one because it's starting to get down to that dangerously thin, like razor like piece of candy. To the person who hates when I slurp on camera, take that. So tonight for dinner at the Lasco residence, we're having veggie pasta. I cook dinners most nights, probably five nights a week. I'm the, the chef. Um, and we're having veggie pasta that will be largely made with fresh picked tomatoes from Lasco Family Farms in the backyard. <laughs> Whatever the crows and the squirrels and the tomato worms haven't eaten is what's going into dinner tonight. Marion has sung with a cough drop tucked into the corner of her mouth live on stage. <laughs> I'm not going to touch that with a 10-foot pole. <laughs> Uh, I hate when you eat cough drops. It scares me. <laughs> I ever tell you guys about the time I almost died from a peanut M&M? Maybe I'll close out today's show with this thrilling story. I think I've told you guys every story about my entire life. And frankly, people always say, you should write a book. Really? Nobody but you guys would buy it. By the way, everybody, please take a moment and go hit the like button, please. Um, go, for, <laughs> go for shish kebab. You know, I don't think there are a lot of meat on those dudes. <laughs> but crow pick tomatoes. <laughs> they take the worm out for you. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, I used to do a lot of traveling for a taxi. I did a lot of public speaking. And uh, one of my little tricks was I was a bit of a wedding crasher because frequently um, I would speak on, at other people's seminars or hold my own seminar in pretty much every major city in the United States and a couple of not so major cities like I, I spoke once in North Dakota. Um, I haven't been to Alaska yet, but anyway. So if I checked into a hotel, um, as I left the registration desk with my little suitcase and I'm going up to my room, oh, look at that, there's a wedding going on. A wedding to me meant free dessert. And I usually had a sport coat with me because I would wear one when I was speaking. I wanted to look like a professional. So I'd go up to my room, I'd brush my teeth, splash a little water on my face. Excuse me. <laughs> I'm a pig. <laughs> anyway, um, and I would go down to the ballroom where they were having the wedding and I would go hit the dessert table. <laughs> I can't tell you seriously. I, I mean, easily 10 to 20 times I did this. I would just walk up, load up a plate of desserts, wearing my sport coat, probably with jeans, uh, and take the plate uh, up to my room. But if I went to a hotel that didn't have a wedding going on, and uh, yeah, I, I was always a good boy whenever I traveled, you know. Sometimes after the taxi seminars, people would be like, come on, go out with us. A bunch of us were going out for a drink. Um, and I would, uh, 
typically avoid that. Never wanted to get myself in any situations that I might regret, you know? So uh, I'm not a, a drinker anyway, but the last thing I want to do is go out and get drunk with a bunch of people and end up doing something that I would regret later in life, like maybe Monday morning when I got home. So um, I would typically get a can of uh, Diet Coke and a package of peanut M&Ms from the vending machine. One night, I can't remember what city I was in. I want to say it was Tampa, Florida. I'm not 100% sure about that. And I would typically, I, I love watching movies on HBO. So I went up to my room with my Diet Coke and my bag of M&Ms. I kicked off my shoes and I pulled out my shirt tails, turned down the lights, closed the drapes, get on the bed, prop up a couple of pillows, hit the remote, start flicking channels, and I've got the M&Ms and I'm doing this you know, flicking them like in my mouth like that. And I flicked one and the second it went in my mouth, I knew it was gonna be lights out. Instantly, I could not get air to go in or out. And within 30 seconds, man, I was starting to feel the, the pins and needles. I was feeling them in my cheeks and my lips, my hands, my toes. And I thought, oh crap, this is it. I'm gonna die in a hotel room and nobody's gonna know till tomorrow morning when the, the hotel maid comes to do the room and she finds me laying on the bed with an M&M stuck in my throat and I'm all like blue and purple looking. So I remembered seeing some guy on TV say, if you're ever choking and there's nobody around to Heimlich you, here's how you can Heimlich yourself. And I went over to the, the desk that had a chair there. Um, and what you have to do is you push down on the chair. You raise the chair up to the highest height. And I'm doing all this while I'm thinking, I'm going to die. Um, you pull a little lever and the chair goes, and you, you know, pneumatic thing raises it up. And then you put all your weight on the chair and you shove it down and get the arms underneath the desk. I'm sure if you had a, like a big, you know, easy chair, you could do it much easier, but I was doing it the office chair, just like the guy showed on TV. And then you whack yourself over on the back of the chair as hard as you can. I think I did it twice. And the second time I did it, man, that M&M came shooting out of there like a 45 caliber bullet. It was awesome. <laughs> Peter Rahill, tension cue. <laughs> oh man. Yep. Killed by an M&M. So, uh, yeah, that was my brush with death. Um, could have died from an M&M. Very uh, inglorious way to end your life. So with that, my friends, I bid you a fond farewell until tomorrow's show, which will be Friday, if you can believe that. Um, I would love it. I, which color? I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. At the time, I was not concerned with the color of the M&M. I was concerned with seeing my wife and children again. Um, see you tomorrow, guys. And uh, I'm glad you enjoyed the show, Marion. And I hope everybody else did as well. And uh, please go into the comments and, and leave me some ideas for topics that I can talk endlessly about tomorrow. All right. Yeah, I, I, every now and then, as recently as two nights ago, actually, Deb and I were watching a, an episode of the Umbrella Academy, and uh, we were sharing a bag of M&Ms, and I did one of those. I went, crap, what am I doing? So, yeah, please leave me some suggestions or questions for tomorrow's show. Congratulations again, JP, on that awesome placement. Uh, I will see you guys tomorrow.